first thing first, okay, so I do have to show you the uh, latest announcement, okay, you know, I hope most of you have clicked on it, you know, but you have not, it is important, okay, because I am giving you the standard input of the program, and this is the uh, generated you know, uh, output of the same input, okay, so the input is the same as in the um, description of the homework assignment, I kept it exactly the same. The upper bound of the five winning numbers is 10, and the upper bound of the Powerball number is also just 10, okay? So that makes things a little bit easier to count. Um, the winning ticket, okay, the, win the ticket that is gonna win the jackpot is one, two, five, seven, eight, and the Powerball number is six. So are we good there? Because does everybody understand what I mean when I said the five winning numbers? And also what the Powerball number is, okay? That because that's part of the uh, the rules of playing, you know, lotto you know, with a Powerball option. And then on the third line, we specify that we want three of the numbers to match the winning numbers, and then the extra two would not match, you know, any winning numbers. And then the zero is specifying that we do not want the Powerball number to match. So according to this specification, it would only print tickets that match three of the five winning numbers and also not matching the Powerball number. But each ticket that it prints is a complete ticket with five numbers of the, you know, win, you know, of the attempt to win, uh, the attempt to match the winning numbers and then plus a Powerball number, a specific Powerball number, okay? So there's also the calculation. <clears throat> uh, the calculation was done um, in class I think on Monday, there should be 900 tickets you know, matching this description. Um, and the way it was calculated was uh, 5 choose 2 times 5 choose 3 times uh, 9 in this case, because there are 9 non-matching Powerball numbers. Is that okay? I think we talked about that, right? Okay. So the actual output here is a file. It's just a regular text file you can download. So I'm going to download it and um, then we can take a look at it. So download, replace, okay, fine. And then we can open it. It's just a text file, so I'm not really sure what, uh, which editor you know, my system is gonna choose to use. Oh, it has to choose something that runs in Wine, which is okay. It's, it's a little bit unnecessary, okay? You know, I'm using Wine to run Notepad in order to display the content of a text file. That's okay, it's not a big deal. So each line of the output is representing a ticket that matches only three out of the five winning numbers and not matching the actual Powerball number. So pick any line, okay? We'll take this line here to take a look. This line, this specific line here. So the one, two, and five are matching one of the three of the five winning numbers because the five winning numbers are one, two, five, uh, six, and eight. Seven and eight, sorry. One, two, five, seven, and eight. Uh, the Powerball number that matches is a six, so a four is not matching. So this particular ticket is gonna match all the requirements that we want, matching only three out of the five numbers and not matching the Powerball number. So is that helping? I mean, you know, just being able to see a sample output based on the sample input. Okay, we're good here, okay, all right. <clears throat> so this particular implementation pro of the program um, is using the approach of only generating the correct tickets. So I'm not using the generate and test approach, which basically generate all the possible tickets and only filter and print the ones that match all the requirements. So you are not limited, okay, in terms of which approach you need to use, um, but either approach is going to require some kind of logic to generate combinations. So that's one thing that I'm gonna talk about today is how do you generate your know, combinations in a way that eliminates, automatically eliminates all the permutations of the same combination. So that's gonna be the first thing we'll talk about today, you know, which should help you with implementing this program. So are we good so far? Do we have any questions? Yes, go ahead. That's a good question. Yes, we are recording. The audio is good. The video is good as well. So thank you for checking. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so 
how do we do this, right? You know, so the way we do this is, um, okay, I can, I am going to choose to show you the logic, but without showing you the actual uh, pseudocode. All right, so just for the sake of this argument, okay, let's say you have a, a, a bag with five numbers, okay? So one, two, three, four, five are the numbers, you know, that you have in a bag. Is that okay? And our job is to choose three of those, okay? Choose three. <clears throat> Ordering is not important. Okay. So that means <clears throat> we have to, we can choose you know, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 5, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 5, and then 3, 4, 5. Those are the actual combinations available to me. The question is how do you do it in a very systematic way and you know, using logic to do it. So let me first you know, kind of show you all the uh, combinations first. So one, two, three is a combination. One, two, four is a combination. One, two, five is a combination. Then I move on to one, three, four is a combination. One, three, five is a combination. Then I move on to one, four, five is a combination. Then we move on to two, three, four is a combination. Two, three, five is a combination. Two, four, five is a combination. Then we move on to three, four, five as a combination, and that's it. Okay? Do you see a systematic approach in this case? And if so, what pattern are you seeing? Um, it's sorted in the greater, um, it's sorted, uh, I, I forget the order, but it's sorted in an ascending order. Yes, it's sorted in an increasing order. In this case, it's not a non-decreasing, it's for sure increasing because we cannot use the same number twice. So it cannot be uh, same anyway. So we are definitely sorting in an increasing order, but there are two increasing order. There's an increasing order on a line, and then there's the increasing order between lines. Is that okay? So that's the crucial part, okay? Because if you look at each line, okay, one, two, three, definitely sorted in an increasing order. One, four, five, definitely sorted in an increasing order. Two, four, five is definitely you know, increasing order. So that's one pattern. But the other pattern is if you look at each line, one, two, three is less than one, two, four. One, two, four is less than one, two, five, which is less than one, three, four, and so on. So, so here's the pattern, okay? Programming, computer science, mathematics, is all about patterns. It's all about you know, recognizing a pattern and then try to figure out how to generate the pattern in the case of computer science. So now the question is, what logic are we going to use to generate you know, this kind of thing? Yep? Can you use a bool for every... Um... <clears throat> oh, okay. no. Yes, you can. Okay. So you can indeed use a uh, nested loop approach to do this. So in this case, because I'm choosing only three items, you know, and the number of trials is constant, so that means I can just use a triple loop approach to do this, right? But then the question is, if I'm using a triple loop approach to do this, what would be the range of values for the outermost loop? What is the range of value for the intermediate loop? and what is the range of values for the innermost loop, right? In other words, okay, if you think about um, you know, this column as i, this column as j, and this column as k, okay, there's one loop controlling the value of i, and then inside that loop, we have another loop to control the value of j, and then inside that loop, we have yet another loop to control the value of k. So the question now is, how do you structure so that j, the starting point of j relates to the current value of i, the starting value of k depends on the current value of j. So that is the question, okay? I'm not going to say any more, okay? You know, all I'm going to say, all I'll give you is a triple root thing for i equals to something, i is less than or equal to something, plus plus i. And then we say for j equals to 
something that depends on i, j is less than or equal to something, plus plus j. And then for k equals to something that relies on j, j k is less than or equal to something, plus plus k. And then all the way down here, you know, I know most of you prefer the C++ approach, and that's why I'm going to use the C approach here, print F, percent D, percent D, percent D, <clears throat> and it's going to be, oh, don't forget the line feed so that it looks nice, uh, I, J, K. All right, so this is my gift to you, is you just have to figure out what to put in the question marks. <laughs> So that this thing, this code here, is going to generate you know, that code over there. And for those of you who are complaining about, you know, but, you know, in the actual output, you're using spaces to separate the values, fine. We'll use spaces. Okay. So I think this is going to be helpful, okay, because this is just a very small sample. It's very manageable, right, because, you know, 5, 2, 3 is exactly 10, okay? And it's very manageable. It's easy to debug this particular program. But the approach is extendable to what you guys are doing. <clears throat> are we good so far? Yes? What do you do with the, so this we're really choosing three, but what if we have to choose four? Like four vectors have to be two, then this won't work. That is a question for you to answer, right? Mm-hmm. So with choosing three, we have a three-level nested loop, right? No, yes, indeed. <clears throat> okay, yep. So if I'm doing correlation like I equals something, right? So J equals something that relates to I, and then K equals something that relates to, that relates to J, right? So the way you look at this is to say when i is 1, j is 2, 3, and only up to 4. When j is 2, k starts with the 3 and ends with 5. When j is 3, k will start with 4, ending with 5. So looking at this pattern, you should be able to find out you know, what these question marks should be. Okay, fine. I'll give you an extra tip here. This is one. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you guys figure out the rest. Oh. <clears throat> yes, I'll let you guys figure out the rest. Because if I give you more than this, I think some of you will go like, ah, oh, man, you know, I was just about to figure it out, and you have to tell me the spoiler. Okay. So no spoilers, okay? Just enough to get you started. All right? All right? You still got more than a week to do it, okay? You still got close to two weeks, two weeks minus two days, right? So you still got 12 days to do it. That's plenty of time. But I want you guys to think about how to do this. Now, this is the most inelegant way to do this, okay? Because it's just, you know, nested loops, which only works when the number of trials is a constant, okay? Which is okay for the homework assignment because we have a fixed number of trials. And I'm not going to tell you what that number is. But the, this approach will work, even though I, this is not the approach that I would have chosen. I would have chosen to use a recursive algorithm to do this, because with a recursive algorithm, it would not be sensitive to the number of trials. Okay, I can have you know six trials, seven trials, two trials. It would be the same logic. It would be the same recursive call to do that. So that makes it more flexible. But since in the homework assignment, I did not say that you have to do it in the most efficient and the most elegant way using a recursive algorithm. I did not say any one of those things, right? So that means you can use the ugliest, the worst possible way to do this. <clears throat> one worst possible way to do this, well, okay, that will work actually, is to have another program to generate all the possible tickets, store everything in its own array as an initialized array. There would be a huge initialized array, and then go through every single one of those and see if it meets the, crit the criteria to be printed out. I think that may be one of the worst way to do it, because I'm because right now my challenge is how do I do this in the worst possible way to make my professor proud? 
And the worst, one of the worst possible way is really just to use a static initialized array that has every single possible tickets stored in it. And then you just have to go through that huge, gigantic array and ask, does this match the requirement? Does this match the requirement? Does this match the requirement? And somebody's going to complain and go like, but tech, that would not be possible <clears throat> because the upper bound of the lucky uh, of the winning numbers and the upper bound of the Powerball number is programmable. It's part of the input. That is true. However, we know the absolute upper bound. Okay, 69 is the maximum of the upper bound of the winning numbers, and then 26 is the actual maximum of the upper bound of the Powerball number. So in your filtering mechanism, you can say, oh, this is my upper bound for the winning ticket is 10, and this particular ticket has 1, 2, 3, 4, and 65. It's not, we're, we're not going to print it because it doesn't meet the requirement. So you can brute force the whole thing like that. <clears throat> in fact, I'm going to take on my own challenge. So I'm going to write the program to generate that initialized array of 300 million items and then use the worst possible way to generate the output. I'm going to take that on as a challenge and see if, it's, see if it is even doable from the perspective of can I even write an executable that big <clears throat> without the compiler you know, just kind of crapping out and go like, we cannot create an initialized array like that. It's too big for me. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm all fired up to write the worst possible version of this program. Yes? Did you actually do your working where you had to show us? Sure. Okay. But not before the homework assignment is due. Oh, okay. Obviously. <laughs> <clears throat> I guess I can make it so that you know people can copy that program, but then they will have to record the actual process of copying the program by hand. So that would be a pretty long video of you know, retyping a program that has 300 million items in an initialized array, and then each item in the initialized array has six numbers in it. You know, just copying that by hand should be a deterrent of using that approach. Is that okay so far? I can give you a kind of like a glimpse of that approach. So let me give you a glimpse of the, of the worst possible approach. <clears throat> so basically what you do is you define a structure, okay? So you define a structure, we call it ticket. And then what you do is inside a ticket structure, you specify that you have the winning numbers, right? So unsigned winning numbers, and it is an array of five things. And then you have the unsigned Powerball number. <clears throat> so now what I do is I create a gigantic array of these tickets. So I say struct ticket, you know, all tickets. And then equals two. So this is going to be a one-dimensional array, but I don't know how what the size is, so I leave it open. So now you basically use the initialized array approach to do this. So we'll start with um, the first possible ticket, which is one, two, three, four, five, uh, followed by a one as the Powerball number, and this becomes the first entry. And then the next entry is going to be like the first one, except the Powerball number is going to bump up to two, and so on. <laughs> and this is going to have 300, close to 300 million items, because we already talked about the total number of possible tickets in a typical lotto game. So it's a doable approach. Would I recommend it? No. <clears throat> so, are we good so far? Do, do you, are you guys kind of getting an idea of how to get started with the project? Okay. So, of the two ways, of the two general ways to proceed with this program, um, you can have one, you can use one or the other approach. So, in one approach, you are using the logic, you know, the combination generating logic is integrated to the criteria of what is a ticket that you want to print. 
So that approach is going to be a lot more efficient because you are not exploring possibilities that you do not want to print. So it is a quicker approach. It is fast, much faster than the other approach. The other approach is what we call a generate and test approach, which means you, know, you have a mechanism to generate all the possible tickets based on the upper bound of the winning numbers and also the winning number and also the upper bound of the Powerball number. And then for each ticket that you generate, you get it passed uh, you, you pass that to a test function to see if it has met all the criteria to be printed out. So it's called the generate and test approach. The generate and test approach is easier because the mechanism to generate all the possible tickets and the mechanism to check whether a ticket should be printed out or not, those are really kind of independent things. So you can easily debug one part and then have that part working and then debug the other part. The first approach, the more efficient approach of only generating the tickets that are suitable for printing out is kind of uh, making the two kind of logic you know, intertwined. So it's a little bit harder to express and a little bit harder to debug. So that's a slightly more difficult approach, but the efficiency gain is a lot. Okay, So how you want to do this is up to you. Okay, So you just have to kind of pick a way to do this. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Can it be applied to both methods, or does it just apply to one? It only applies to one of the methods, unfortunately. Let me see. Mind probably the same. <laughs> well, what does it look like to you? Probably the generate and test. Exactly. Yep. This only applies to the generate and test approach. Because you're generating every single thing, so instead of a printf down here, you you put the printf inside a conditional statement so that the condition of the conditional statement is acting as a filter and say, this is a possible ticket. Does it match the requirement that we need in order to print it out? Does it have exactly like two out of the five winning numbers? Does it match the Powerball number? So those are the things that you have to evaluate. If it does match both of those criteria, then you print it out. Yep. <clears throat> Okay, are there any questions about this program? Maybe I should change the nature of the homework assignment and say, turn in six different versions using six different approaches you know, to solve the same problem. Yes, go ahead. So uh, in this particular example, since we have, we're asking for three numbers to, to match, yeah. that means that we have to have... Um, well, we are not asking for three numbers to match. We are choosing three out of five in this case. Yeah. Like, um, you mean in the sample that I gave you yeah. back here? Yeah. I totally lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> so we have to have it at least like only three numbers in that case, like only three numbers match. So no more, no less. You can't have a ticket that's got four numbers that match the Powerball. So this would not be applicable to your specific homework assignment because in your homework assignment, you have to choose five because every single ticket has five numbers on it. So if you use the generate and test approach, you're going to choose five. You cannot be choosing three. On the other hand, if you're using the approach of generating only the applicable tickets, then yes, you can say out of these five you know, winning numbers, I only want to choose three of those then you have to choose two of the non-winning numbers. But the approach would be the same because you know, when you choose the non-winning numbers, you have 64 choices to begin with, right? For the first number that you choose from, and then for the second number that you choose from, you would have 63 choices. But you can use the same approach. You know, basically, you know, the, <clears throat> the approach of using a double loop or triple loop here, you can do a double loop to pick out the two non-winning tickets. But you are not gonna, it's not gonna be as easy as just you know, starting with a certain range here because it depends on which ones are the winning numbers and which ones are not the winning numbers. So that gets a little bit more complicated because we don't know which ones, you know, because that part is based on the input file. So you cannot make it a constant like this approach here.
if you look at the actual output, okay, let me see if I can uh, still have that or if I close that tab already. <clears throat> I think I've closed that tab already, but that's okay. We can go to, um, we can go here and then we make a new window and then open up that file that I just downloaded, uh, which is lotto.out. Okay. So when you look at this file, you can actually see what approach you know, this program is using because you know the first thing you see are the three numbers that are matching out of the five. And then no matter where you go, okay, let me scroll all the way down, okay, so scroll down here. You can also see that, you know, the, the, the three matching, the, the three winning numbers are always the first three within the set. Now, we also know that in the set, ordering really does not matter. But it gives you a clue that this program is not a generate and test pro approach. It does, you know, only generate the applicable tickets. So it is only choosing, um, three of the five winning numbers, then it chooses your know, two of the non-winning numbers. So this particular program only go through the appropriate tickets, it's not generating and then testing, it is only generating the correct tickets to begin with. So it's a much more efficient algorithm. So by looking at the output of this program, you probably can get a sense of you know, how it is done. <clears throat> Any questions about all this stuff here? In other words, there are many ways to approach this particular program. You know, you have more, you have about 12 days to do it. You know, there's plenty of time. So I would suggest using a method that may not look or may not be the most elegant, but get it working first. And then if you have time and also the interest and the motivation, then you go for a slightly more, you know, elegant approach and then go for another more elegant approach. So the idea is, you have something to turn in that will get you all the points, then you refine the program as, you know, well, I mean, some of you may be motivated and some of you may not be motivated. Yep. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no, I wasn't ready to my hand. Oh, okay, that's fine. Not a problem. Yep, go ahead. Okay. Just making sure. Mm -hmm. So, the input tickets are being used from our running no, in this case, it's just you know, me naming those files, you know, like that. So I can also show you how I ran that program, okay? So the program is in the temp folder. It is called Lotto, okay? That's the executable. So the way I ran the program is simply to run the program, Lotto, and then I created, you know, a program called, I mean, a file called Lotto.in that specifies the 10 numbers that serves as the input to the program. And then if I just run it like this, um, okay, fine, it needs a dot slash because it's not in the path. So there we go. So it just generates everything and print it out to the standard output. But if I want to capture that, because you, in, order to, in order to debug a program, it makes sense that you want to capture the output, then you can use an editor to search through it or at least count the number of lines and stuff like that. So this is how I created the input and the output file. The input file, is nothing more than you know what you saw in the homework assignment and also you know what I put into the announcement. So if I look at the uh, lotto dot in, you know, it's just a regular text file with the numbers you know on these lines. I mean, where you break the line does not even matter because when you use C in, um, a line feed is treated the same way as a white space, so it doesn't even matter if I combine all eight, all ten numbers on the same line, it will still work but I want to keep the same format as in the explanation in the homework assignment, and that's why I broke it up into three lines. Yep. So if we do a little bit more editing way, would we have extra credit for that? <laughs> you will get the extra satisfaction that you did it in a more elegant way. So I think this is interesting. Uh, it's an interesting discussion. You know, obviously this is not a psychology class, so the difference is, are you intrinsically motivated or are you, ex you know, externally motivated? So you know, that's the difference. You know, based on that question, you know, um, the answer to that question will kind of point you know, people in one of two directions, intrinsically motivated or externally you know, motivated. Yep. Can't they just uh, hard code in everything? Um, and just make like a like 70,000 line program? <clears throat> Oh, it's going to be more than that because if you think about all the possible input, you know, um, 
Well, let's think about all the possible inputs, shall we? <laughs> we know that line two by itself has 300, close to 300 million, you know, possibilities. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's even without thinking about the first or the third line. <clears throat> So if you want to use a gigantic map from what the 10 numbers can be as the input to the actual output, in theory, that can be done. <laughs> but I'm not even sure that you can, you know, the C compiler can handle, you know, a program of that complexity if you want to hard code everything. It's a bunch of right? Yes, <laughs> indeed. Everything boils down to conditional statements. Yep. All right, so are we good so far? Okay, so do it. Remember, okay, get it working first and then think about how to get it to work in a more elegant way. Because I think by the time you get it working the first time, you'll get some idea of, oh, I could have done it this way and it's more flexible, it's a little bit more elegant. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> there's a little bit more to the announcement itself. Uh, because I also specified how long it took for the program to finish its job. It is five milliseconds. So five milliseconds to create all 900 lines. And that's including uh, the time to write to the file, the, all the I.O. operations and whatnot. So um, it's just a little benchmark number for you guys to compare to if you want to. I think this is going to be an interesting problem to add to uh, the lead code collection of you know, problems. Was it, uh, are we able to write this in C++? I wrote this in plain C. Okay, but can we write this in C++? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, as an option, you can use C++ or Java. Okay, I just read that last uh, little line. <clears throat> And you can also look at the uh, size of the executable. Now, this is not a challenge, okay? Don't kill yourself. You're trying to make your program shorter than mine. So if you look at the, um, the size of the executable, so this is mine, okay? The, number, the size of the program itself, the executable, is uh, 18,776 bytes. And I did not even try to make it even shorter. There was no optimization turned on by the, you know, with the compiler either. So don't kill yourself, okay? You know, this is not a challenge. Do not try to beat me to make the program any shorter so or any faster. Psychology. Huh? Reverse psychology. Reverse psychology. <laughs> or do I do you think I already know that you guys know about reverse psychology and therefore I'm using this to get you to not to do something that you thought that I would that I was asking you to do. Uh, we can do that. We can say uh, WC, which is uh, word count, not water closet. <clears throat> um, so uh, 120 lines. And I use uh, one line for open curly brace and one line for closed curly brace. You know, so I, you know, I don't try to come back lines you know, in any way. So this is the source code. I did not put in a whole lot of comments. Okay, So kind of take that into consideration too. Cool. So are you guys getting a fairly good idea of how to get started with this project? Okay. So don't try to implement the entire thing first. Okay. So what I would do <clears throat> is really just to get the first program to do what uh, here. So just get your first program. Just write the logic to generate this output first. Okay. So it's not even based on the input. Don't even bother with the input. Just you'll say that, okay, I have five numbers, one, two, three, four, five. How do I generate the combinations of choosing three of, out of the five numbers? <coughs> Just get, to, get that to work first. That would be a, I can, I'm going to say, you know, about 20, 25 line kind of program, okay? Because once you get that working, that would give you a basis of how to, you know, kind of add additional code on, you know. So don't try to write, like, 50 lines of code and not testing a single time. <clears throat> so in your case, 
Um, the upper bounds are programmable. It's based on the input. So I can, so the input file or the input can specify, you know, the upper bound to be anything from, it has to be at least five, obviously, because, you know, in order to choose five things, the upper bound has to be five, right? And then for the Powerball number, it has to be at least one. But one would not make any sense depending on the, these two parameters. Because if I want to say, you know, print all the tickets, well, okay, it will still make sense because you can print no tickets. In other words, if there's only one Powerball number, then the ticket that you generate has to match it. So if I'm looking for uh, tickets that do not match the Powerball number, then the output will be empty because no ticket will meet that requirement. Okay. Well, all I'm saying is, is it the IJ thing? This mm -hmm. thing will only look to three. Yes. Okay. So we made that. that so thing. so then you go like I J K L M, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. So I think I have dropped enough clues you know, to at least get you guys you know, started. Um, and then you also need, uh, for, those who, for those of you who are using the generate and test approach, then you also need a mechanism to test a ticket to see whether it meets the requirements or not. Okay, so that's another subroutine that you have to write. All right, is that cool so far? Okay. <clears throat> and then after that, we're going to write this program, rewrite the entire thing in assembly language. <laughs> in less than 256 bytes of opcode. All right. So there is that for this program. Okay. So we can talk about this next Monday. You know, hopefully, you guys will get some time over the weekend before we meet again on Monday to get something done, okay? Maybe not the entire program, maybe just the part that match a ticket and see whether it is supposed to be printed out or not, or you know, just the part that generate all the combinations. But you know, get started early, okay? At least get a portion of the program done you know, before Monday. Um, because if you push all the way to the last you know, one or two days, you know, um, it's not gonna work well, okay? So get started early. All right, so that is that. <clears throat> and as you write this program, you know, one thing that you can do, you know, it also depends on, you know, whether you're motivated to do that or not, is to document your own thought process when you write the program. Um, that may be an interesting um, thing to do, is to document the process, you know, that you go through when you write that program, when you debug a program and then you come up with an approach, you know, how did you do it? Okay. Cool. And um, and I know that some people would think of chat GPT right away. It's like, okay, I'm just gonna put the entire description of the homework assignment into chat GPT and see what comes out of chat GPT. I'm actually curious of that too. <clears throat> But you have to remember, you know, ChatGPT from your perspective should be a good tool for learning, but not a tool to give you the actual solution that you turn in. Because at this stage, okay, you need to learn how to beat ChatGPT. If ChatGPT can do all of your homework assignments, you won't find a job. You won't find, you know, there won't be anyone hiring you, right? It only makes sense. So what you want to do is to learn how to beat chat GPT, find out what it cannot do that you can do, okay? Not for this class, not for your degree, but for your future em and your know, employment. That is something that you have to keep thinking all the time. Well, since I'm old, I did not have to think about that when I was a student <laughs> because there was no internet either when I was a student. There was no internet, there, was, there were no websites, you know, everything was hardwired. So it's a different time, and you know, I don't have to worry about things that you really need to worry about. So, I do not mean to depress you, but you know, that's the reality. <clears throat> All 
All right, so we are getting started with this new topic, you know, which is your know, big little O is actually Omicron, okay, you know, Omega and Theta, okay. So this is a pretty heavily mathematical kind of discussion, but it is actually important because computer science is a branch of mathematics, okay. As much as you know, most people do not want to believe that, do not want to acknowledge that, computer science is a branch of math. Okay, <clears throat> so what we'll do is we're going to start to talk about algorithm time complexity. Um, so we'll start with a story, okay, which is not in, in my actual modules, okay, it's just a story. <clears throat> so let's just say that, you know, you were hired by a pizza shop, okay, you know, like pizza guys or pizza hut or whatever, okay. So they have to deliver pizza, right, you know, you have a pizza delivery, you know, kind of job. And that's part of your job. So as part of that job, okay, your boss said to you, okay, we want to deliver all the pizzas before they get cold. It sounds reasonable, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure some pizza shop would advertise that they guarantee that the pizza would not be cold by the time it's delivered. So what do you do to kind of get the best out of your route so that your pizza will stay as hot as possible by the time they're delivered? What do you do? Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. Oh, you no. raise your hand. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, you can probably filter, like, get a general, get a general idea of how long it takes before your pizza starts to get cold to filter that with your delivery route. Okay, so I like that idea. So you got delivery route, okay, the concept of a delivery route. Yes. I would uh, see how long it takes to get the pizza cool down. And then mm -hmm. within that time limit, see how far you can get within your store radius. Okay. Now, you don't get a choice of how many pizzas, you know, or the locations that you have to deliver. Because that's your boss, you know, saying, okay, we got this stack of pizzas that you have to deliver, and these are the addresses. The only degree of freedom that you have is the ordering of, you know, which location you go first, and then which location, and which location. Is that okay? All right. So let's just say that you have six locations. You know, you have six pizzas to deliver at six you know, different addresses. Okay? So what do you do? So we'll just call those locations A, B, C, D, E, F. Yep. You look for the one with the biggest pizza and deliver it first. <laughs> that actually is a good optimization, but you're not optimizing for pizza your temperature. You're optimizing for your tips, okay? Which I cannot blame you for. <laughs> so but you still need to evaluate, right? You know, because you know you have these you know, six customers, and how much they tip depends on the temperature of the pizza. So you still have an optimization problem here, right? So the whole point is, it is an optimization problem. So with six destinations, how many different routes do I need to consider? So now we have your. Know, yep, go ahead. Thirty-six. <clears throat> It's yeah. six factorial, okay? It's six factorial because out of A, B, C, D, F, okay, which one can be my first destination? A, B, C, D, or E, or F, right? But if I choose A as my first destination, I have five choices for my second destination, namely B, C, D, E, F. If I chose B as my first destination, then I have A, C, D, E, F as my you know, second destination, and so on. So from the perspective of a tree, okay, the first level of the tree always has six branches. But the second level of the tree always has five branches, and then four branches, three branches, two branches, and then down to a single branch, because by the time you get to the sixth destination, you don't have a choice anymore, because the other five destinations have been visited already. You only got one choice left, which is not really much of a choice. So that's how we get six times five times three times no, six times five times four times three times two times one, which is six factorial. Is that okay? So how much is six factorial? Okay, let's do some really kind of quick calculation here to figure out what is six factorial. That's an easy one. So we have you know factorial of six is seven hundred and twenty. So with only six possible six destinations. You have 720 possible routes. Now, I don't care what you're optimizing. You can be optimizing from the perspective of 
tipping, okay? You can be optimizing from the perspective of the temperature of the pizza, okay? You want the last one to still be kind of hot, as hot as possible. You may be optimizing from the perspective of fuel, okay? You know, because you're, you're driving a gas guzzler, okay? You're driving a full-size truck, you know, with a six-point-something liter engine just to deliver pizza. So now, you know, fuel becomes a big equation of, you know, how much money you actually end up in the pocket, right? Okay, so I don't care what, what you're optimizing, okay? You have six, 720 routes to consider. And then for each route, you can just go like, okay, I'm going to plug it with a Google map, figure out how much time it takes, and then the last stop is going to have the temperature of the pizza all the way down to 120 degrees or whatever, okay? And then you can find the best route. It's like, okay, this route will give me the best temperature distribution you know, across all the stops. Or, you know, in this case, you know, uh, I would get the best tip, you know, combination, okay, and so on and so forth. But you have 720 routes to consider. Are we good so far? So that means the time complexity, time complexity of the program that you're writing is proportional to the number of destinations factorial, or the factorial of the number of destinations. Does that make sense? Okay. So you use this program, okay? It works really well for you and also your colleagues. <clears throat> the pizza place, your boss, you know, decided, okay, I'm gonna share this with all the other franchise owners, okay? Because everybody wants to do the same thing. It worked great. And then one day, your boss called you to, to you know, the office and said, you're fired. Your boss is upset, and you're fired. You go like, why? I think the program has been working well. You know, we have shown that you know, we can keep delivering our pizza, you know, optimizing for whatever we want to optimize, okay, but it works well. Why are you firing? Your boss says, you know, your program doesn't work. You go like, no, it has been working for the past six months. What do you mean by it's not working? All right, well, you know, I got this friend who's working for a you know, uh, delivery truck, you know, business like UPS or FedEx or USPS. And, you know, and I gave the program to this, you know, other you know, person and, you know, hoping that it's going to optimize, you know, for his, you know, business too. And the program never came back with an answer. It just, you know, it just gave me the hourglass. It never came back. You go like, that's not possible. I mean, we have been using this program for months and it only, get, it only took like up to two seconds to come back with the best route out of, you know, six destinations. And then you remember this class. You go like, oh, time complexity. The time complexity of this algorithm, which is an optimization algorithm, is the factorial of the number of destinations, right? So five destinations is 120, six de destinations is 720. Seven destinations will be 720 times seven, which is like, what, a few thousands, okay? So those are all you know, fairly low numbers. You go like, okay, it cannot be that bad. Then you ask your boss and go like, so how many stops do you, th you, know, do you think your, you know, the delivery truck company needs to make on a daily basis? It's just you know, 80, 80 stops, you know, which is nothing, okay? By the way, you know, if you work for UPS, I think they make typically you know, between one to 200 stops a day, okay? So 80 stops is like, it's nothing. You go like, okay, so, eight, so if I have six stops, it will consider 720 different routes. So 80 stops cannot be that bad, can it? So 80 stops is going to have a time complexity of 80 factorial. So you say, um, how bad can it be? Okay, you know, we talked about inefficient algorithms you know, in the classes all the time. Um, bubble sort is bad, okay? It is, you know, X, it's N squared, right? It's bad, bad, bad. So you go like, okay, six, you know, squared versus 80 squared shouldn't be that bad. But factorial is notorious. Factorial is really notorious because, you know, if you look at the factorial of 80, this is what you're getting. <laughs> okay? And you know, for those of you who have not taken assembly language programming and don't know how to read the scientific notation, let me read it out to you. It is 7.1569 blah, 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 times 10 to the power of 118. Imagine 7 
followed by 118 zeros. Hmm? Yes. No wonder your boss said your program did not come back. Because it, it's, it will come back. It's just, just going to take a very long time to finish the calculations. So now what do you do? Okay, so remember, you know, the entire topic of time complexity is to save your job. So how do you save your job? You go like, hmm. I remember Tech talking some, about something related to time complexity. He talked about something like NP complete. Okay, so an NP complete is a set of problems, and they all have quote unquote the same time complexity of the factorial of the size of the problem. They are transformable to each other using polynomial time. So all of these problems are considered the same class of problems. It's called MP complete. So I did not make this term up. Okay, you can actually look it up and look up what is MP complete. So I'm not going to get into the actual detail of what is MP complete, but the traveling salesman problem, which is the pizza delivery problem that we just solved, is an MP complete problem. It's within that set. So how does that going to how is that going to save your job, right? Because remember, your program still does not work with the truck delivery truck your company. Because what you can do is to tell your boss throughout the history of computer science, okay, all the way starting from Alan Turing's days in the you know 1940s, the late 1940s, up to now, nobody can solve this problem in an efficient way. You can tell your boss, you can fire me. But I can almost guarantee you the next person who take my job cannot solve this problem either. Because this is what we call an intractable problem. It is not like that it is not solvable. It is just an extremely difficult problem to solve. And the NP complete, okay, let me see if it explains what is NP. It does not explain it here, sort of, okay. So can someone kind of guess what NP is representing? <clears throat> Non-polynomial time. That is that is non-deterministic polynomial time. So it's not non-polynomial. It is polynomial, but it is non-deterministic. So now the question is: We kind of know what is polynomial time. You guys have all taken or is taking 430, so you can compare the algorithms, right? You know, quick sort is n log n, um, merge sort is n log n, um, bubble sort is n square. Okay. So you can kind of understand what is polynomial time. Okay, it is the size of the problem to the power to a fixed power. It can be two, it can be three, it can be sixteen, it can be something that looks really ugly, and to the power of twenty. That is still polynomial time. Okay, so you know what is P. So what is the N? N stands for non-deterministic. But what does that mean? It means that you can have an infinite number of computers, all working at the same time. And it will still take polynomial time to solve the problem. How does that translate to the problem that we were just talking about? How is that polynomial time? How is it polynomial time? And why does why does it become polynomial time when it is working on a non-deterministic machine? Okay, think about the um, the delivery truck scenario. Okay, so we're going to go back to the spreadsheet to look at that insanely large number. This number here. So imagine that you have a computer that can have five in seven point one three times ten to the power of one hundred eighteen parallel processors running at exactly the same time. Okay, so now each processor only has to consider one of the many routes to come up with the answer. Okay, this route is going to take this much time. Okay, and then all you need to do is to figure out a way to find the best route. But to figure out the best route out of these many routes can be a uh, log n type of problem. So you know, so the problem is not quite just you know, polynomial time, but it is close to just polynomial time. So that's what non-deterministic means when we use the n word in MP complete. It means you have no limitations of parallelism. You can have as many parallel processors going on processing you know, at the same time. 
So NP complete means even with a magical computer like that, it will still take polynomial time to solve the problem. Yep. Is the assumption parallel to serialism? Hmm? Is the assumption serialism? Exception? Mm, what do you mean? That I do not know. Um, I just know what MP, what the MP is standing, is representing. So many of you will become a computer science major at a four-year university, and then there's a class called um, the Theory of Computation, or Automata. You know, there are a few names you know, to describe that. They will talk about the various machines that Alan Turing came up with. So there are finite state machines that are deterministic, and there are finite state machines that are non-deterministic, and that's when you will kind of get a further discussion of what we are talking about here. But are we kind of convinced that you know, um, time complexity is an important topic? You know, because even if you're not inventing your own algorithm that you have to analyze the time complexity of, you still need to understand time complexity because most of the time you get to choose an algorithm to get a certain thing done. So you have to choose the correct one so that it has the smaller time complexity. Okay. For instance, okay, just an example. In the sorting, right? You know, in sorting, quick sort, merge sort, they all have n log n complexity. And then with uh, bubble sort, they have n squared complexity. So for someone who does not understand the uh, implication of time complexity, they can be choosing bubble sort because the algorithm of bubble sort looks a whole lot easier compared to merge sort. Okay, so from the perspective of writing the code, bubble sort is easier. But from the perspective of time complexity, bubble sort is bad, okay? It's just bad when you have a larger array. <clears throat> so how is that important when you are just a developer? You are not a computer scientist. You are not coming up with new algorithms. So why would that be important to you? You, to write code that is more efficient or make use of library calls that are more efficient. So can you imagine what would be the consequences if you choose the wrong algorithm that has a complexity that is higher than it needs to be? You have to like understand your use case, you know? Mm -hmm. Like the person, say, who was using the program knew that there was 80 different routes, mm -hmm. right? They would have used something different. 80 destinations. Or 80 destinations. 80 destinations ending up with that yeah. many different routes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and this is the kind of thing that most people do not think of. You know, they, do not, they cannot imagine that with only 80 destinations, we have this many possible routes. So the whole concept of factorial, most people understand factorial. 5 factorial is 120, 6 factorial is 720. So they understand the concept of factorial and the, the, the concrete values when you have a relatively small number and then a factorial. But once you get beyond a certain point, it just becomes insanely large. Um, and you know, I used to have a Casio calculator where the largest number that can be represented is, some, is something times 10 to the power of 99. Okay? And the largest factorial I can do was 69. 69 factorial is the last factorial that my calculator can actually calculate because 70 factorial is already exceeding 1 times 10 to the power of 100 which is more than what the calculator could represent yep so factorial you know, increases really really fast <clears throat> all right so I'm gonna give you guys a second story you know since we are you know storytelling today when I was writing my dissertation you know that was a long time ago you know uh, I think I had one of the first ThinkPad uh, notebook computer from IBM back in those days. So Lenovo was, it existed already, but it made computers to be rebranded as IBM. Um, it wasn't a really powerful computer, 20 meg of a hard drive you know, and stuff like that. But my dissertation was not really complex either. Okay, It was only about 69 pages long. Uh, double spaced, you know, 12 point font, so it's not by any means a large document. But I had a lot of cross-referencing, so I put bookmarks you know, everywhere, and then in the text I would say, 
refer to section blah 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 for a discussion of blah blah blah. Okay. <clears throat> so it was working fine, you know, and then at some point it started to become really slow. Okay, saving the file or just to get it to print out something, you know, to generate the printout was taking a long time. And then at one point it just wouldn't do it. You know, I continue to write the doc the dissertation, and then when I click save, it just hung up on it. Now, even to this date, I do not know what's wrong with Microsoft Word 2.0, <laughs> but I knew that it had something to do with, guess what? Time complexity. So whoever wrote Microsoft Word, specifically the part that deals with cross-referencing the sections and whatnot, chose an algorithm that was awfully inefficient. When I click save or print, the program just would not come back. Now, I cannot remember how I dealt with that situation. I think eventually I upgraded to Word 6.0. You go like, so you went from version 2 to version 6? The answer is yes. Apparently, Microsoft does not know how to count. So from version 2, it just jumped all the way to version 6. Um, but that's a real life example of the influence of time complexity. Okay. <clears throat> So I'm hoping that you guys are starting to understand why we have to deal with all these all these math concepts, because it does matter. Okay, you know, you know, depending on what you're doing, you know, it does matter. Even for people who say who say, I just want to write some video games, it still matters, because especially video games. So, think about this, in a video game like a 3D you know type of video game. When you're rendering things, what do you think needs to happen? You have a whole lot of objects, right? You know, missiles, spaceships, aliens, and whatnot, okay? So something has to figure out, how do I draw those things on the screen? Now, these things, you know, some things are in front of other things, right? So it seems to matter that, you know, the ordering or the uh, how things are arranged in the z-axis which is you know, how far are, are they away from you, is important. Because if you have a bazillion of aliens, okay, hiding behind the planet, do you want to waste the time to render those you know, aliens? No, because the planet is in, in, the, in the way, so you know, why waste time to render those aliens when they're not going to be displayed? So the algorithm that you use to basically prioritize what do you need to paint, okay, what is going to be visible to you, becomes important. Because a, a, an algorithm that does not take this into consideration, will try to render everything, it's going to be very slow. So your game is not going to sell, and then you're going to be wasting all the time to write that game because it's not going to work. So even in game you know, programming, efficiency is important. In fact, I would say it's even more efficient than many other applications. So that brings us to the actual discussion, okay? So in the actual discussion here, we have a very simple algorithm, okay? This algorithm just, you know, add up all the numbers in a particular array. So you can see that we have a sum, you know, uh, variable. It is initialized to zero. The index, you know, that we start with also, is also initialized to zero. As long as the index is less than n, which is the size of the array, all we do inside the loop is to add the element value to the sum and then increase the index by one until the index variable is no longer less than n, then we stop the, the algorithm. So we want to kind of look at the actual time complexity of this algorithm. So the bottom line here is the actual time, which is f of n, is some kind of constant of t1 plus some kind of constant of t2 plus n times some kind of a constant of t2 plus t3. Okay, all the constants can fold into one single one, so basically, you have one constant that does not depend on n plus a multiple of n that depends on you know, another constant. Is that okay? So this is the exact amount of time. Now, you can have something that's more complex. Okay, So we can have a, an algorithm you know, like bubble sort. So bubble sort has a time complexity that looks like this. Okay, These are the components of the time complexity of bubble sort. So there's a certain constant here, which is the amount of time, that really does not depend on the size of the array. Okay, the initialization, 
you know, just a tiny little bit of code, you know, that you have to do regardless of the size of the array. There's another constant here that is only proportional to the size of the array itself. Okay, so that would be the outer loop of bubble sort. Okay, anything that you do with the outer loop of the bubble sort is contributing to T2. And then we have another T3 here, which is a constant, but it states in what is proportional to the square of the array, okay, the square of the size of the array. So that would be the stuff that you do inside the nested loop. Okay, you know, that's where you get the n squared you know, in the time complexity. The bottom line is when we are comparing algorithms, these two are not important. We only want to care about, you know, do we have an n squared or do we have an n cubed? Do we have log of n? That's the only thing that is relevant because when you plot the shape of a curve, okay, one is n squared and the other one is n cubed, it doesn't matter what the constant is. Eventually, the n squared algorithm will catch up and beat the n cubed algorithm. If you're comparing n squared versus n log n, the n log n will catch up and beat the n squared algorithm. The only question is, how big do you think the n needs to be when there's a crossover? Is that okay so far? Does everybody kind of understand what I'm talking about? The shape of the curve is more important than the constant that you multiply to the shape of the curve. <clears throat> yep? Can you demonstrate that? I feel like I understand the... Yes, we can absolutely demonstrate it using a spreadsheet. So we'll, we'll have... Yeah, that's enough. That's enough time for another you know, story. So today is story day. Yes. Okay. Yay. Okay. So story day it is. So this time we are going to be talking about Tag as an old time employee with the company, and you know I've never changed my machine because it has always been sufficient for me. So I'm running this your know, 386 SX your know, PC that has 16. Well, there's no gigabytes back in those days. So we'll just say you know two or three megabytes of RAM, okay? So that's my machine, okay? I've been working using it all along, and it seems to work fine with me. And then um, we'll say Pat, okay? Pat is a new employee, so Pat has this you know super duper you know i nine you know powered you know PC with you know a, a insane number of cores and you know sixty gigs of RAM and all the best you know hardware, okay? So the boss says you know you know. The company is downsizing because we we lost that deal with the uh, the truck you know delivery truck company. So we have to downsize, right? So we I can only keep one of you, okay? Tag versus your know, Pat. And whoever can you know uh, implement implement a program that takes the least amount of time to solve the problem is going to be staying with the company. Pat is looking at my PC and go like. Pfft. I don't even have to think about this. I'm going to beat you, you know, any day. So the problem is to search for a particular record within an array, and the array is sorted. Is that okay? So we have a sorted array, and my job, the, the job of the program is to look up a particular entry. Is that okay? So Pat went online and looked for the algorithm that can do this. Hmm. Here's linear search. Pretty easy loop to implement, okay? And then Pat even looked at your know, binary search and go like, well, the time complexity is different. I have no idea what is log of n versus n, okay? So I'm just gonna use your know, linear search, okay? Because that seems to be fast enough. And besides, Tech is running a dinosaur of a computer. How can he possibly beat me with my super duper computer? I can run circles around him, okay? So that's what Pat decided to use is linear search. I looked at all the algorithms, I compared the time, time complexity and go like, oh, log of n, that's much better than linear time. Okay, so I chose and go like, okay, I'm gonna use that one. So now we're gonna look at the size of the problem, which is n. So we start with an array of one. And this is tax computer, how much time it takes. So we are just gonna say, you know, uh, in units of time, it will take me one unit of time to solve this problem because it takes one single comparison to tell whether the only element in the array is the one that I'm looking for or not, right? Kind of makes sense. <clears throat> in Pat's you know, algorithm, he's also using, you know, a he's using a linear search algorithm, which also takes only one comparison to see whether the only element in the array is what we are searching for or not. However, 
because your pet has a much faster computer, the amount of time it takes for that one single comparison is a billionth of what it would take my computer to do. So there's a factor that your pet's computer has, which is a billionth. Okay, you know, his computer is a billionth times faster than mine. So that means you know, it's one, uh, one divided by one e, a billion is nine, right? Okay. So it took that much time for Pat's computer to finish the same operation. The actual unit of time is not important. Is it a millisecond? Is it, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just a ratio, okay? So, you know, Pat is laughing and go like, Tech, you're, just pack your bag, okay? It's time for you to go. They go like, no, 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 let's, let's increase the number of problems to, let's increase the size of the, of the array to three. So when you have an array of three items, it will take two comparisons in binary search to find or confirm whether the element or the value is in the array or not. Because you know, the first comparison is with a set with the second element, then you can determine that, okay, it's either the first or the last element, then it takes the second comparison to confirm whether one of you know, whether that remaining one is the one that you're looking for or not. So my computer is gonna take two units of time. Pat's computer, on the other hand, is just gonna be proportional to this number times, you know. Uh, divided by one e nine, so Pat's computer is going to take that much you, that, that unit of time to finish the operation. So Pat is laughing again. It's like not even close, man. You know your your computer is taking so much longer. I'm staying with this company. So the next one is going to be seven. <clears throat> My computer is just going to be saying, uh, just add one to this, right? Because with one comparison. With seven items to begin with, I would have three items left, okay, on either side of the element that I compare to. Then it becomes, you know, two more comparisons. So that's how this works, right? So with Pat's computer, it's going to take, you know, just proportional to this time. And that's going to be, okay, come on, let me copy the equation down here. Is that okay so far? So we look at this and go like, um... I don't see any time that Tech is going to keep his job, right? So the way we're going to do this is to say, this is just going to be whatever this number is, times 2 plus 1. So the next one is going to be 15. On my computer, I'm just adding 1 every single time. Because when you double the size of the array with binary search, it will take one more comparison. Okay? So to me, it is just whatever this number is, just add 1 to it. With Pat's computer, it's you know whatever you know that factor is, and then times you know the number, the size of the array. So you can see that uh, okay, it's not even close. So we just have to make this larger and larger and larger, okay? So by the time <laughs> it's already way past the crossover, it didn't take that long, did it? So when we had a problem. Thirty-six is the crossover. You're right. you're correct. So by the time the the size of the array is let's see, boom boom. Okay, let me count again. So this is about seventeen million entries in the array. So by the time the array size is seventeen million and something, um, the order of the magnitude of time is about the same. Any you know, at that point, it will take my computer thirty-four units of time on Pat's computer. It would take 17 units of time. Isn't that 17 billion? Hmm? Billion. 17, yeah, 17 billion because we have nine zeros after that. So when we double the size of the problem again, my computer is almost beating Pat's computer. And then do it one more time, my computer is beating you know, Pat's computer by good margin too. So after this point, the difference is only going to get bigger and bigger. So to answer your question, the curve of a log of n versus the linear just n is, is only delaying the inevitable. So even though there's a factor of a billion, okay, in terms of the execution speed of the computer, it's only a matter of, okay, I just have to increase the size of the problem to a certain point, then it's going to cross over, and then my computer's going to win after that. Yep. Isn't this also the like, worst case scenario? 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with linear search, you can do certain things. If you know the array is already sorted, you can optimize yeah. because it, when the value that you're searching for is has no match up to this point, but the array element is already larger than the value that you're looking for, then there's no hope they can find it. So, But it will still be proportional to the size of the array when it comes to the number of iterations to go through. Yeah, so it's only delaying the factor by maybe one or two more times <clears throat> in terms of you know, well, bumping well, up I the size. For your thing, uh, for your algorithm. For binary get, search? Yeah, for your for your binary search, they could get lucky and find it on like two number, like type that is correct. Type or something like that. Yeah, but this is the worst case scenario. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's what I meant by the shape of the curve. Now, with something like this, you know, you can also plot it too. So you just use uh, the you know uh, plotting a chart, and then we can do a. You know, it's already pretty clear, you know, what it looks like at this point. So we'll just go ahead and say, yep, we'll go for this. Yo, but how do I? Oh, it's already accepting it. That's fine. So this shows you the red line is the um, linear curve, then the blue line is the log. And you can see, you know, okay, it's it's a really kind of compressed scale. But you can see how the, the blue line, after a while, is almost flat compared to the red line. And, you know, if you change the factor of difference between my computer and Pat's computer, all you're doing is moving this intersection point to a later point. But they will intersect. And then the log of n algorithm will win. It's just a matter of how big of a problem do we need in order for the blue line to beat the red line? So this is the real importance of time complexity because it does not even matter what computer you're using. Because at some point, it doesn't matter what that constant is, the shape of the curve is what is determining what is a better algorithm. Now, if you have two algorithms, they're both n log n, then yes, the constant becomes a factor. Okay, um, I'm going to spend one more minute to talk about this. If you think about um, merge sort, okay, there are two ways to do merge sort. One is to do it in a tape way, which means you have two, uh, you have three arrays. You're reading sequentially from two. You're merging into the third one, and then you're splitting the third one back into the two, but in a linear way. The other way is to do an in-place merge sort which is basically just you're breaking up the array you know, and do it recursively. Those two approaches have different constants associated with it. And it has to do with the hardware of your computer. It has to do with a DDR technology on your computer. What is DDR? What does it stand for when you purchase memory? Yep. It's what? Dance Dance Revolution. Dance Dance Revolution. Okay. So we can see, you know, two rams, you know, doing the dances. Yes. Okay. I can I can imagine that. I have an imagination. I can see two rams kind of dancing and dancing up each other. DDR stands for double data rate. Okay. So it is a mechanism where if you read sequential memory uh, locations, it's super fast. But if you want to read individual locations, just kind of random access, it's not so fast anymore. Okay. So with DDR technology. The approach where you read and write arrays in a linear fashion is actually faster because your hardware is already designed to streamline that process, sequential access. The recursive way of doing merge sort kind of go all over the place. And it is actually slower compared to the other approach, which is which uses you know, the linear uh, read and write approach. So when you have two algorithms, both having an n log n you know, time complexity, then the finer points of the constants become important. But most of the time, you know, we just want to look at the actual time complexity without looking at the constants. So to kind of give you guys a reading assignment, so what we want to do, okay, what I want you to do is to read from section three, which has a lot of terms, a lot of math stuff like this, okay? But read it, okay? Because this is not easy reading, and that's why I want you guys to read ahead of the class, okay? Because it's not easy; those are not easy concepts. So read ahead of the class, and then on Monday, next Monday, we'll start to talk about these concepts.
All right. So have a nice weekend, and I will finish grading you know later today, and at least you will have your grade you know on your Canvas your know, account. I'm only short like five or six years short now. Just six more to do. Okay. <laughs>